Good afternoon and welcome to a uh, Oak Harbor City Council workshop. Today is Wednesday, July 20th. It is 2 p.m. I'd like to call our meeting to order uh, at this time. This will be both a physical meeting location and a virtual meeting. Some members of City Council, well, no, not City Council, but some of our staff are participating via teleconference. Guests that are included in staff presentations will be excused uh, from the Ring Central meeting at the conclusion of the agenda item as appropriate. Today's meeting may be viewed live via YouTube and on, on cable channel 10, uh, HD 1090. Uh, we do not have any action items on a workshop agenda today, so we'll dispense with the calling of the roll. Looks like we have a full council here, uh, which is great. Uh, uh, we've had a request from staff to place the update on police fleet replacements to the beginning of our agenda to accommodate scheduling. So we will begin with that item at this time, uh, police, uh, and that's police department, police fleet replacements. And I believe today we have our, uh, our chief of police, Kevin Dresker, um, and our central services supervisor, Sandra Place, to present the update. So I'll turn it to them. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon and good afternoon, City Council members. This is uh, Sandra Place, Central Services Supervisor, and I will be presenting this item with Chief Dresker. So, so this item is called the Police Fleet Re Vehicle Replacements. Just a quick recap, our replacements are approved during the City Council budget time. We give you a list of vehicles and their anticipated replacement costs. And per our code, we bring anything to city council that's over $50,000. Uh, last week, actually over the last three weeks, we have been meeting with every single city department. We've gone through every vehicle and equipment to talk about these questions. What are our needs? What are, uh, could we use something different? Um, EV options, all of these things we have talked about and tried to make sure that we were using the money efficiently and effectively. We have a replacement process that we use and several purchasing tools, state and federal contracts, interlocal agreements, formal bidding, sole sourcing. And today we get to talk about the Ford SUV hybrid patrol car replacements. Um, the budget for this 2022 year, R2, the P13, P14. We actually tried to do this last October when they opened up and because of distribution, it closed within two months, I believe it was. And so we missed the, the deadline. And so they're going to be opening up again here on August 1st. And we, in 2023, we actually have five of these uh, SUVs up for replacement of which only three of them meet the criteria at this time. We're very excited to present this information to you because we have had the hybrids now for one year and we have some data that we can match towards uh, Ford's data. So here we put together this spreadsheet that shows you what Ford said we were going to save for fuel savings if we were to switch from our normal police interceptors to the, eight, the hybrid ones. And P19 is one of our regular ones. And you can see it was running at 1,139 gallons per year, really close to that 1,176 that Ford said. And then P7 is one of our hybrids that we've been running for a year and we're only using 866 gallons per year, which is very close to where Ford said the hybrids would be at the 833. So that's very encouraging that we're, we are getting what Ford says and we're seeing a, a fuel savings. So we actually can put into a system our data and I was using just an average of $4 of a gallon for our gas. And we based it on one of our patrol cars. And this is what it came out with that we are saving $3,868 um, a year. And so if we actually were to change out all of our patrol cars, all nine of them, we would see a fuel savings of $34,812. This, isn't, this is not in addition to the idle time savings that we're showing as well. So Ford put together this spreadsheet. It deals with uh, two shifts per day. We're only running the one shift per day. So we made sure that we showed on the right side there that Oak Harbor is saving $1,960 a year that we're not idling. And that's 499 gallons of fuel per year that we're saving. And if we multiply that by the nine patrol cars, 
we would have an additional savings of $17,640. So altogether, we could see a savings of $52,452 a year if we were to switch over to all of our patrol cars being hybrid. And that is a cost of one uh, basic car, not with the outfitting. In addition to that, we're having environmentally friendly savings. Uh, we figured that we're saving about 17,000 pounds of um, CO2 output, which is great for our environment. And we're also seeing lower maintenance costs. We're able to um, see that the engines are not having as much wear and tear. We're only doing oil changes every two thirds of a time now, and we bring them through for an inspection, but they're not actually doing the oil changes except for every third time. And the brakes are regenerative, which means that they're having less wear and tear and they last longer. We put together the replacement costs. We're estimating that the vehicle cost is going to be around $47,000. We do not know that until they open up on August 1st, of which 5,000 of that would be the hybrid option that you add on to the vehicle. So base price 42 and that extra five for hybrid. Our outfitting costs are estimated around $20,000. That's because we cannot take over the existing equipment. So we will need new light bars and striping to do the black and white cars and whatnot. We also updated the radios. These new radios need to be encrypted and they are running around $8,000 each. So we're estimating that we're gonna have about a $75,000 cost per each vehicle, not to exceed cost. And we do have the funding available in our recruitment rental replacement program. So our proposed action today is that we would like to propose to council on August 3rd to replace two of the budgeted patrol vehicles with our hybrid vehicles and to pre-order the additional three that meet criteria because we found on the last hybrid replacement, it took us 12 months to get the vehicle. So by the time we get them, we feel that we will be right on track. And we would like to bring this forward on August 3rd to city council for your um, approval. And that way we're ahead of the game for when the state contract actually opens up on August 1st. And at this time, I'll turn it over for questions. Thank you, Sandra. Nice job there. Uh, turn to council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Munns. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sandra, in the, the uh, bar and the radio and the stuff you can't, does that also include the wrap for the car that says, you know, Oak Harbor Police in this signy on it, or not yet? That wouldn't include. Yes, it. that that is the striping that that oh, was okay. included in the seventy-five thousand. Yes. Okay, striping and yeah. wrap are two different things to me, but thank you. Oh yes, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Question? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sandra, thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Okay, we'll go then back to our um, item on the agenda, which would be development services. Um, start off with the 2022 comprehensive plan amendments. And for that, we have our principal planner, Kak Kamak. Kak, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, members of the council. Um, I have a short presentation on the 2022 comprehensive plan amendments. Um, we do annual amendments to the comprehensive plan and we have a process for that. Uh, the city council approved the docket uh, at, in uh, March and we are working through all the amendments. We have had a couple of discussions with planning commission and using this workshop to share some of that information uh, that we're discussing with planning commission and and uh, take council uh, input and thoughts on on this as well so uh, i am going to share my screen and we'll get uh, started on this all right um so this is a presentation uh, i am aware that we can see all the slides in the in the side i'll stick to the screen because i know if i go into presentation mode it puts it on a different screen we'll keep it simple um, so, um, items that are tracking on our 2022 docket, um, we have the housing element open as the council is aware, we are implementing our housing action plan, uh, even, um, uh, at the last council meeting, I think the city council considered the density standards. Those are actions that are implementing our housing action plan. And we have more uh, coming forward, uh, later this year. 
We also have the JPA and UGA boundary capacity discussion with the county. Uh, this has been an ongoing discussion with the county for several years. Uh, we are in continuing discussions with them. Recently, the council is aware that we had those uh, discussions for uh, the land trust grant, and there was some communication regarding uh, that with the county. So uh, this is in the forefront, and we're trying to get the county to get it on their um, on their docket for consideration. Uh, the transportation element, uh, we have the active transportation plan, uh, and that's also uh, active. <laughs> uh, uh, right now, we are uh, we went through a consultant interview process. We've uh, narrowed it down to one consultant, and we're negotiating a contract. We'll bring that contract forward uh, to the city council here in the next couple months. Capital improvements plan. Uh, this is a budget year, so an important year to sync the capital improvement planning process in a couple of years worth of projects with the budget. Um, and that discussion um, is also um, ongoing and already initiated with the various departments. And uh, that information will be brought forward as well. The land use element uh, of the comp plan is all also uh, open for amendments. And here we have some land use changes and corrections to consider. Um, and this is mainly the topic that uh, I'll share information with the city council uh, today on. And this is the discussions some uh, we've had with the planning commission. Uh, some of these changes are related to the planned residential estate. And I'll go through e each one of these um, kind of land use changes or corrections in more detail. Um, the planned industrial park and planned business park designations, and I think I mentioned this to the city council during the docket process, trying to trim up our regulations and, and make them easy and simple. This is one of the uh, options to consider. And then we also have some land use anomalies on our map. And uh, one of the examples is the North would be fire station. And we'll go through some of those details and we can consider changing those um, to um, uh, actually benefit um, the uh, use and the, uh, and the surrounding properties. We don't have any um, uh, sponsored amendments uh, this year. Normally in the past, we have gotten some land use changes um, since we 2016, we've generalized our land use map that allows for rezonings to happen easily. And so we get less of these sponsor amendments. And this year we have none. So in all the changes that we're considering, I uh, just wanted to kind of provide this overview of where uh, we're considering these changes. Uh, so this is just a schematic of how things are implemented development wise. Uh, the zoning map and the development regulations are the implementing tools. Um, the land use map, uh, the sub area plans and go goals and policies, that's the comp plan uh, and the vision. Uh, that is the uh, comprehensive plan. And that's where we're talking about most of these changes. We're not talking about changes actually to the zoning map or development regulations. So uh, the land use changes, that is kind of what we want to focus on today. And I'll go over some of these um, in a little more detail. Um, again, we want to um, switch over to a map. So one of the land use changes and corrections we want to consider for this year is uh, the land that is currently actually outside of the city. This is Oak Harbor Road, and this is Gun Club Road. And these are the properties that are located outside the city. This is the Harbor Heights, uh, the what will be the Harbor Heights uh, facility in the future. Um, so this, um, the, these properties over over here in in the past uh, before 2016 were designated as planned residential estate, and that's what that is the planned residential estate. And in our transfer in 2016, we updated our land use map, we digitized our land use map, and we generalized it. So there was a lot of changes. And this was just an error. It got designated, accidentally designated as low density residential. And um, this is something that we want to correct because this is north of Northeast 16th. 
the planned residential estate is a very uh, unique uh, um, designation, and it's intended to keep the uh, density of the current uses as is. Uh, so we don't want to increase the residential density, but we want to continue uh, to allow property owners to use their property uh, in their current form for as long as they want. So this designation is specifically for that. So this is just an error and we need to correct it. And so uh, we should revert to plan residential estate. So that is one of the changes that uh, would be good to consider this year. Um, any questions on that before I jump to the land use um, trim? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, CAC, so the got goobered up in the writing, and so we want to leave it and as long as the original owners have the property, they it stays that uh, plan estate level of density or non-density. Um, are they getting city water or would they be able to apply for city water or because it's not officially in the city yet? Um, I didn't know where the water and the sewer stood on that. So we're not asking them to annex. We're just trying to make sure that the land use is written so that they can keep doing what they're doing. But it, go ahead. Yes, uh, you are correct. We are just changing the designation so that they can keep doing what they're doing. We're not asking them to annex. If they do want to annex, they can uh, annex into the city and we can provide water and other services that are available because we do have a water line that runs along Gunfield Road. Um, so we're just changing the designation so that they continue to use the property as is for however long they want. Uh, even if property owners change, they can continue to use it as is. Have you communicated with them or has this come on their radar or would this be, I mean, once this gets <laughs> through, would we be sure to let them know that it's, or we notify the county that, hey, there's no changes in this designation or I'm, what do we do with this information once it gets approved and we've corrected the, the description? Yes, this, this uh, uh, correction is for the city's maps. Uh, it does not affect anything on the ground. Uh, it does not affect their property values. It does not affect their zoning. And it does not change anything uh, as far as their land use, land designation, or anything in the county is concerned. Uh, this is a policy document that we have, and it's an error, so we're changing it. So they won't ch see any any changes uh, on anything, basically. It won't impact them at all. Um, Area-wide changes like this are legislated. Uh, they're not property specific. And unless there's a change that's really impacting the property, we don't notify the property owner because it could be confusing. Um, so uh, legislative processes, at least at the legislative map levels, unless it's very property specific and it's going to directly impact them, uh, we usually don't do notifications because it'll be confusing. And this will be a slightly different. I'm glad you brought this question up because when we talk about the next topic, we'll talk about some of the notifications. Thank you for clearing that up. I was just trying to be sure. Now, in three months from now, I may not remember all this language, but I, at least I can look it up and know it's correct. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, there are no other questions I can... Um, go to the next uh, discussion item go ahead um okay so this is a land use trim uh, i'm calling it the land use trim because what we're trying to do is again simplify or consolidate some of our land uses so we have um the uh, industrial designation of the land use map and i'll just go back to this for a second so all of these these brown uh, colors on our map is designated as industrial in the land use map. But when you get into the zoning map, uh, they are classified in differently. They're classified into plan business park, plan industrial park, and just plain industrial. So there are three zoning classifications that implement this brown color industrial. What we found over the years in the use of the zoning district is a lot of people that do the development here 
uh, do not want to follow the planned business park or the planned industrial park process. It's like a planned residential uh, uh, development. It's uh, very cumbersome in terms of process and uh, requirements, and it's very and it's based on a very old concept of the 80s and 90s when corporate offices were doing all these big parks and. Those concepts didn't materialize here. However, the processes that were designed to accommodate them seem are still in our books, and they may be limiting uh, what people can uh, potentially do with their property. So, uh, this uh, proposal is to try and consolidate all of the zoning classifications into one district. And so, I'm going to um, quickly see if I can uh, switch screens. Can you see the Excel spreadsheet? Okay, yes. I'm guessing you can. Barely, but okay. it's up there. <laughs> yes, I just uh, don't have to see clearly. I will try and zoom in. But what I wanted to really show is the zoning uses uh, that are permitted in these districts. What would happen if you consolidated the PBP, PIP, and the industrial districts? What would be the impacts and what would happen to the uses? And I just wanted to show you uh, before I jump, there are only five uses that are really impacted if we collapse that district. So th this is a table, uh, Excel spreadsheet. This is all the permitted uses. This is from our zoning ordinance. And what I have done is just collapsed all of those tables to just show PVP, PIP, and I. And as you can see, the I category has a lot of uh, permit, uh, permitted uses and conditional uses. And then the uses fall off in the PVP and the PIP. So when you consolidate these, you're becoming more inclusive, not exclusive. And so you're creating an, a category that is uh, that can accommodate more uses. Um, as you collapse these uses uh, and go into the higher zoning district, uh, you want to try and see how you want to uh, push those uses up to the, to the higher use. So if, uh, if the uh, PIP, if a particular use, for example, the equipment rental, and I'll jump to back to my presentation. So these are uh, basically the five uses that are, are, are dealt with differently in the three uses, uh, in the three zoning categories. Uh, for example, equipment rental in the PIP is a conditional use, and in the industrial use, it is a permitted use. Most of the other uses are permitted in both PIP and I, or PBP and I, so it's it's okay to naturally progress them into the higher district. These are the ones that we have to think about, five uses. So for these uses, staff has done a proposal just based on logic, just going upward. If you're going to accommodate a less impact use in a higher impact zoning district, just make it easier to go into the permitted category, unless we think there are impacts. So the, the one that, um, staff does not have a recommendation. This is really a community choice is the hotel motel. It was a permitted use in the planned business park, but if you collapse it into the industrial zoning, does the city want to condition it or not permit it at all? Because in the previous instance, they did not permit it in the industrial district because maybe there are impacts. Um, Hotels and motels in industrial districts can be successful uh, right next to noise zones. Um, for example, SeaTac Airport has a lot of hotels around it. So it's kind of relative. I think even from the Navy standpoint, they don't consider it as a residential use unless it starts to become long-term stays. Uh, but this is really a community choice in terms of whether you, we want to permit a hotel or a motel in our industrial zone. So I've left that kind of with the question mark and maybe that's something that we can discuss. 
Uh, some of the other uses, the caretakers' quarters uh, coming up to the industrial, it's permitted in the other districts and was conditional in the industrial. Again, caretaker quarters could have impacts and they'll be better off conditioned. Again, that's what's proposed. If the community thinks differently, we can change that. And again, uh, for these schools and distribution centers, they're permitted in the lower districts. Uh, when you go to a, a general industrial district, it's just better to permit them than to have conditions on them. So these are the only five uses really we're dealing with when trying to simplify our land use categories. And so this is something that we thought we'll do and then take away the lengthy processes that we have for the, the PVP and the PIP. Now, again, this, uh, in going back to the question of property notification, again, this is something that we're doing at the legislative state right now. So at the comp plan level, what does this mean? Actually means just changing a couple sentences in our land use uh, element to say that the industrial category will implement uh, the industrial zoning and, and take away the PVP and the PIP. This again does not change anything for the property owners. However, we want to come back and rezone all the properties that are PVP and PIP into industrial zoning. That's a zoning change and it's an area wide change and will take a little longer and will take a little more time. And as council member Munz mentioned, we need to inform the property owners and educate them on this collapsing of this land use and what it means for them. So it takes a little longer. And so what I'm proposing to do is to do the area wide rezoning in the next year's comprehensive plan amendment, because it will be an area wide zoning. This is just an idea level, legislative level change we're considering at this time. We're doing a lot more analysis to make sure we're not having any impacts but to do the actual zoning and uh, on the uh, on the map change, I'm proposing that we do that as part of next year's comprehensive plan amendments because it can get confusing if we try and combine it right now. So that's the uh, proposal on the land use trim. And before I jump to land use anomalies, I'll stop and, and open up for questions. Thank you, CAC. Any questions at this point? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. I will go on to our next one. So I'm calling these land use anomalies. And these are land use anomalies. I'm calling them anomalies because the land use designation is slightly different than the zoning des designation. Now, some of these could be done uh, by design uh, and by choice. So in areas where the city would like to see change, uh, and development. Sometimes the city will designate the land use map for a higher land use. And then when redevelopment happens, property owners want to rezone their property for a higher development, they can, and they can apply for a rezoning to match the land use. So sometimes there's inconsistencies placed on these maps in order to facilitate redevelopment. So in our uh, land use and zoning map, there are some designations like that that have been placed to accommodate either some anomalies. Um, and so I'll quickly point some of those to you on the map. And then there are some that were again errors, um, errors that were done in 2016 through the conversions. And I'll point those out to you. And I think we should change some of those. And then we have a couple, uh, I think that we're, we're not really clear how it happened, but we have some suggestions on, you know, uh, changes to, to consider. Again, uh, I want to remind uh, council that we're only considering changes to land use designations and not considering changes to zoning classifications at this time. So some of these anomalies, and this is a map, it's very general and probably hard to read from where you're sitting. Uh, but that's okay. I uh, just want to show you a distribution of some of the, the uh, inconsistencies in the map. And I want to say that the ones that you can see as red dots are ones that are deliberately play a uh, different land use and zoning. And they're primarily, I think, because some of them, well, this one is the, the, the big red dot is the golf course and it was designated uh, in the zoning wise, it's R1 zoning low density. 
but in the land use map, it's designated as open space. And I think that may have been done on purpose um, because the, the open space was something that needed to be calculated for the city um, during the comprehensive plan, initial adoption of the comprehensive plan. And so they adopted this as open space. But originally the developer uh, developing the golf course could have requested the R1 zoning and so that's how it could have stayed. So we're not requesting changes like that that could be by design to stay as is. Some of these other smaller dots are mainly church properties and they have um, the, um, uh, the pastor's house adjacent to it and they have combined those into uh, the church's uh, zoning so that the uses could be used flexibly. Uh, so I think those are some of them are, are by design. Um, however, the other ones, I have a little more detailed map and we can look at them. A couple of them are errors and a couple of them are just something that we may have to make a choice on. So uh, one of the errors that we have on the map is the this uh, kind of triangular shaped uh, piece of land here on Barrington. And this is where the, I think there's duplexes and fourplexes, and it is actually zoned R4, which is a high density residential, but in the land use map is designated currently as low density. And I think this is an error, again, uh, in the map, when they were digitizing the map, these shapes could have easily been um, uh, misaligned uh, and the computer could have easily read this as all single family. So I think this is an error and uh, can be changed back to high density, uh, res high intensity residential or low intensity commercial. That's the district that uh, houses the R4 zoning uh, and which is what this property is currently zoned. Uh, another one which we think is, the, is an error is the Whitby Avenue and Heller uh, Street. There's a, on the corner there, there's a, again duplexes, I think, and there, it's zoned R4. And I think it got misdesignated as low density residential in the 2016 map. I think those could be changed. Um, this one is the um, fire station, North Whitby Fire Station on North Heller. And this is kind of a strange anomaly uh, from my perspective because it is designated low density residential and also zoned uh, low density residential. And I'm not entirely sure how that happened or whether it's an error or not. Um, but I think changing this to public facilities will give the fire station more options and better opportunities to continue to improve their property and provide service. So this is something that we can consider changing at the legislative level and if the uh, uh, fire station wants to apply for a rezoning, uh, they can. And we can definitely let, they are already aware that we are considering the land use change for them. So um, there, there is some awareness on this uh, piece of property in terms of change. Um, now this one is, on the corner of 7th and Harvest Drive. And this is on uh, Northeast 7th Avenue as you take a left or a right, depending on where you're coming from Highway 20. Um, so most of the uses along that southern stretch uh, is zoned uh, for RO. And there's two properties that are right at the very end uh, that have been designated as low density um, residential. And I think that is probably an error, again, based on this. Uh, but I'm also not entirely sure whether that was by design to convert these two properties back to residential at some point. They are zoned for a higher intensity than what the land use is designated. So my inclination is to say that the land use map is an error and that it should be changed to um, to uh, high intensity residential and low intensity commercial. And that will give them more options uh, for the property uh, than designating low intensity uh, or low, uh, low intensity residential. So I think this should uh, also be changed. So these are some of the anomalies and proposals that uh, we've discussed with the planning commission uh, so far. So um, on these land use anomalies and some of which are corrections, does anybody have any questions? 
uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, CAC, across the street on 7th is the bike shop, and then right next to it are trailers. Is that, are they in um, city? Um, yes, they are. we're talking about and this there, corner. That, that would be high density. Uh, down the corner where it hits uh, Oak Harbor Road. Yeah, I think they're zoned R3, maybe. Uh, let me see. Uh, I have a map here. So they are zoned R3. Uh, so the, the bike shop and all that um, housing development behind there on that northeast corner of 7th Avenue and Oak Harbor Road. Okay, I just didn't know if try to match and it up or just give this one property on the other side of the street uh, more options. I'm, I'm trying to see when we talk about not having enclaves, you know, where the city is and now where the city's not and where you have city water and when you don't, I, I'm just trying to, because the map is really little, but I'm just trying to connect the dots, you know, you've they've talked about development to kind of flow like you have the high density and then you move to uh, like apartments and then you have condos and then you have single family so it's kind of a, a tiered thing so I'm trying to visualize because there is a neighborhood behind that corner that you would change that runs into the Elks Club if I'm not mistaken and those are single so I'm just I'm trying to connect the dots but I having a hard time seeing it. So if you could just simply explain it or I'll just meet with you at another time. I'm just, I know the city likes to have things kind of flow and so that's all I'm asking. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, let me show you a, a, maybe a little bigger map. I don't know if you can see that. So I think you're talking about these two properties. So that's what the zoning map currently is. And this is 7th Avenue, the wetlands are here. The bike shop I think you were talking about is over here, along here. Um, but this is zoned currently as the brown color. The brown color is RO. And so those two properties are zoned RO. But if you look at the, um, the land use map on my presentation here, it, it was designated as low density residential and I and I think I understand your point trying to create a buffer um, between the residential and the office use and so this one makes more sense for it to be RO because it has that northeast 7th avenue frontage and um, it can make use of that because it's almost like a minor arterial uh, for um, kind of a mix of uses there and residential may have a little more impact um, than being on Harvest Drive. Yes, that, that helps. And if we can ever get that street done with sidewalks, because the density of apartments and people that walk up it, even though there's barely a sidewalk on some sides, pushing strollers, that, that will be wonderful. So thank you for blowing up the map. I really appreciate that. Welcome. Any other questions or input? Okay. Go ahead, GAC, or are we, we done with that section? Yes, I think uh, that's all I have. This is just to give you uh, uh, an update on the discussion, and um, we'll be bringing back most of these after they have gone through their notification processes for action. So um, if you have any questions or any comments at any time about these, please feel free to contact me or send me an email. So CAC, I assume with, the, with these last three, uh, was it three or four, that you will communicate with the owners uh, at such yes. time. Yeah, and, and make sure that they understand and agree. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, we will notify the property owners on Northeast 7th Avenue because I think that's, uh, a change that they may want to be aware of. And then the North Whitby fire station is definitely one that we want to uh, make them aware of. 
The others are corrections and it does not impact their zoning or change or anything. So it may be a little bit, bit confusing if we, if we notify them of this change. Okay. Um, it's a very legislative process and, and based on our code, when we do legislative, especially when we do area-wide zonings, they are, uh, we don't need to necessarily notify the property owners. But I totally understand for these smaller ones where it is an anomaly and where it is impacting their change, we definitely want to let them know. Thank you, Kat. Okay, we'll go on to item number B under development services then at this time, which is critical areas, ordinance amendments. And for this, we have our senior planner, Dennis Lefebvre. Dennis? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to present a couple of amendments that we are proposing to our critical areas, uh, mini uh, actually our Oak Harbor Municipal Code. And let me just do a full screen here. And actually what this procedure is, is to provide a consistency between uh, the shoreline master program and our municipal code. As some of you may remember, we engaged in a, a multi-year effort to do a periodic review on our shoreline master program, which was adopted by the council back in June of last year. Uh, as required by the Washington Administrative Code, there were three primary areas that we needed to look at as part of this periodic review and update. Uh, one of them is to make sure that the new master program was consistent with our existing local plans and regulations, uh, such as a comprehensive plan that CAC was just talking about. Uh, also to incorporate any amendments that were made to the Shoreline Mas uh, Management Act as well as any Department of Ecology rule amendments that were made since uh, our prior Shoreline Master Program, which was back in 2013. And the other third item that we needed to look at was to make sure that we incorporated any new information or changed circumstances or any improved data that we had for uh, management of our shoreline. We did receive grant funds to work on this periodic update and we decided to focus those funds to prepare a study that analyzed a, a portion of our shoreline, which is called the Residential Bluff Conservancy designation. Uh, this is that really sensitive area that's along Scenic Heights Street, uh, pretty much on the west side of um, our harbor. That study was prepared by Coastal Geologic Services, uh, which I included as part of uh, your packet in attachment one. And they came forth with a number of recommendations um, and they actually ranked those recommendations high, moderate and low priority um, to make changes to the Shoreline Master Program and ultimately the Municipal Code. We made most of those changes as part of the shoreline master program. And uh, like I said, that was adopted by council. So what we're doing now is coming back and making sure that our municipal code is consistent with our shoreline master program. Uh, there are basically two areas that we are looking at as far as um, for providing this consistency between the, the two documents. Uh, the first one is essentially the setback from um, the top of the bluff of a primary structure. We have in our code at this point uh, 25 feet. Uh, we are looking at increasing that to 50 feet for the primary structure only. Uh, such things as accessory buildings or decks uh, may be still permitted within 20 feet. Uh, again, that's based on the best available science that we have, which was that study. And he said, basically, uh, as far as a, uh, the moderate review of current sea level information, um, 25 feet is cutting it pretty close for the potential recession of the bluff. So we are looking at increasing that to 50 feet. 
Uh, and again, it does not impact existing structures. Uh, we're not going to ask people to move their house 25 feet further back if they're within that uh, 50 feet. But it would impact new development in that area. The second primary area that we're looking at uh, amending is the use of private tight lands as part of a density transfer. Some of the tight lands are privately owned and part of lots. And what we have in code at this point in time is that that essentially useless property, uh, the amount of property can be used to transfer to an upland portion of the lot and used to increase the density. Uh, it was surmised by the study that that additional density does create some stresses on the upland bluff environment. And also, according to his experience, uh, which is Jim Johannesson, he's done a lot of work on in Island County and, and around um, all the shorelines of Puget Sound. So that's a highly unusual uh, allowance in our code. Uh, also, by removing that density of transfer, uh, that would remain consistent with Island County and Jefferson County. So those are the two primary areas that we're looking at amending and provide consistency with our shoreline master program. This is a legislative step. Uh, this is a, your first touch, obviously. We do have in our code a review process five, which deals with code amendments. It's in um, 18.20, the municipal code. We do require a public hearing before the planning commission in which I'll bring forth their recommendation to a, a city council planning commission uh, public hearing. We did have a first touch with the planning commission last month at their June 28th meeting and uh, we didn't have any recommended changes at that point. We did our due diligence with the Department of Commerce as far as providing the 60 day notice of intent to change our um, development regulations. We did our CEPA review period uh, that is closed at this point in time. We have not received any comments from uh, anybody. This is the city council workshop for your first touch and we will be coming to the planning commission for a public hearing next week and bringing it back to you at your September meeting for public hearing and hopefully adoption. I've also had our legal team review the ordinance which we prepared. I think that's um, attachment two of your packet and that concludes my presentation and I would certainly be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Uh, Councillor Heisen has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dennis, I do have a, a question. You mentioned that this doesn't impact existing structures, would only apply to new development. Um, I recently was on the beach looking at the bluff of a um, in-process development, and I could see the stake, you know, the pink stakes of the little flags that had initially been staked up on the bluff. The the bluff had already eroded so much that those stakes were now either on the bluff or down on the beach or you know somewhere in between. They'd already fallen down. So if something hasn't been built yet but is been permitted and is in the process, what happens when the bluff moves in? I mean, does the setback start from the original bluff or does it start from the new bluff? How does that work? Well, Councilor, I think the, the key statement you made was Permit it. Um, if it has been permitted, that means it's consistent with our code that was in place at the time. So this would be in effect for any subsequent new developments that would be proposed. Uh, we would apply this code as adopted or hopefully adopted to any new developments. Um, what's in, in the works at this point in time, we can't retrofit. Okay, that makes sense. So it's from the old bluff at the time that everything was staked out and, and permitted. That's I mean, because I imagine when you have a, a landscape that's continually changing, you'd have to be continually changing, you know, the process and nothing would ever get built. So Yeah, it it's it it is a it is a moving target actually. So sure. um, uh, we're just looking at increasing that buffer uh, for future developments. I think that's a really smart idea. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So, um, Dennis, I have a question, a couple of questions, I think. Um, obviously, the Tidelands and those people that own them um, are pretty much just around our Oak Harbor Bay area here. I mean, I can't think of any other Tideland ownership that would be inside of our city limits. Um, and you mentioned uh, this potential change will will get us um, uh, the same as a couple of other counties, but I don't think I heard Skagit. I don't know where they're at, or are we be ahead of them or behind them in in uh, in making this change? I don't know, Mr. Mayor, about Skagit County, but I do know Island and Jefferson County do not allow that transfer density in, in tide, privately owned tide lands. You just, um, you just, I just said, you just said from, Island? No. You mean Island? Island, yes. Oh, and Island Jefferson. County. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt you there. Okay. But we don't yeah. know about uh, Skagit. I do not, no. But I could do some research on that and bring it forth back to you. I'm just kind of curious. I, it, it makes sense what you're talking about doing and, and for the right reason. Um, I'm, I'm thinking at it a couple of different reasons, of course. I have some Tidelands that I own, but I know the city also owns some Tidelands. Um, and, and in fact, a substantial amount of Tidelands. And so I would assume that, uh, you know, any change is going to affect city ownership too. And, and, you know, I doubt that that makes a difference, but it's just a, a curio curiosity, I guess, in my part about those uh, that will be affected. And, and as it pertains to Tidelands, I think that uh, my recollection is that, generally speaking, it goes out to the mean low tide line that ownership does. So from the average high tide to the average low tide is quite a bit of property in, in most cases. So I, th I think what you're saying is when you try to add that amount to an upland piece that somebody wants to develop, it doesn't make sense. It stresses it. And and I, I, I think I certainly agree with that. I just am Yeah, uh, what you say is very uh, right on, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, Dennis, when the mayor was talking, um, there is still hopes. I think there's a line but no money in it for to rebuild the pier the downtown that burned in 1965. And so the pilings and the cement block and stuff have all been left so that it could be rebuilt. But usually with the pier, you have a wharf that goes out, you might have a fuel dock there, you could have a little convenience store. So is this going to affect something like that? If the city, at one time, the city was pushing hard to move our marina because we own the land over here. We own it over there, but the way um, the environmental uh, was pushing it, we threatened to to move the marina, pick it up and just move it, but couldn't move the building. So I'd like a little more explanation if the city were to rebuild the dock. And generally on a dock, you can get ice and sodas and snacks and whatever, I mean, it's not a big store, but it's still a building on top of a wharf that is on top of the Tidelands. And so I guess I'm not sure about the transferring or being able to build out there. Um, I'd hate to take away that decision. I don't want to destroy it, but it's that would definitely add commerce to our downtown for people to be able to pull up on a floating dock and Oh, by the way, I'm going to get this and this, or you know, whatever. So, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, the answer is, we would apply that development to the other regulations and, and policies that we have in our shoreline master program. This transfer density would not affect that type of development. Um, it, there would be other regulations, and of course, um, a ton of other permitting that would be required. But uh, I, this transfer density on the tight lands would not affect the development of that nature. All right. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, so I don't yeah. see any other questions at this time. Uh, we'll um, thank you again for all that uh, work. We'll move on then to our next item, which is under finance. 
And uh, for this, we have a grants update, and I think we have for the very first time before us our grants administrator, Wendy Horn. Wendy, welcome. I know it's not your first rodeo doing this, though, uh, but uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm the grants administrator for the city. I've been with the city for about three months now. Um, I hail from Alaska, where I spent probably the last 25 years writing and managing grants. So I'm excited to be here. Today I'm just going to give you an update and provide basically an overview of what we've got going on in the city, both um, currently and then near and long term. So you may or may not be aware that we have a wide variety of different departments that have annual grants. Um, the police department has five grants that are renewed each year. The Stone Garden, Target Zero, and Stop Grant are all grants that are reimbursable for um, patrols or investigations. The Traffic Safety Grant is an equipment grant, and it purchases small things like radar guns. The Bulletproof Vest Program is um, a reimbursable grant. We receive 50% of the cost, <clears throat> excuse me, anytime we purchase a new vest for a police officer. The fire department has two grants. Um, the pre-hospitalization grant is for EMS or trauma equipment. And then they also get $500 each year to purchase and distribute bike helmets to kids. The public works department has a um, biennial grant that addresses stormwater issues. The marina has a annual grant that reimburses us for the maintenance and operation of the boat sewage disposal facility. And then we receive $15,000 from the Whidbey Island Marathon, or for the Whidbey Island Marathon, excuse me. So all in, we get about $140,000 a year in reimbursable grants. And then we have what we call funded projects or one-time grants. The Public Works Department has a number of them, um, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. But we have um, an LED streetlight conversion grant that is in conjunction with Puget Sound Energy for $220,000. We have received some funding for the Northeast 7th Avenue um, improvements um, from the Island Regional Transportation Planning Organization. That's also known as the IRTPO. We have a small $12,000 grant to repair some of the sidewalks this summer. Uh, we also just received a grant from Ecology to do um, a wastewater nutrient study. And then you might be aware that we accepted $50,000 from T-Mobile, I think it was in December, to replace the dock at Windjammer Park. Fire also was awarded $10,000 this year to um, purchase bunker gear. And uh, you just heard CAC reference both of these, the housing action, um, plan implementation, we we'll call it the happy grant <laughs> for short, and um, also the active transportation plan that he's working on. And then the marina does also have a grant from Commerce for $392,000 for um, reimbursement for some of the upgrades and repairs that we did this past year, I believe. And then we have applied, well, you all are aware that we are working directly with record excuse me, Representative Rick Larson's office, to get a direct appropriation for the $1.95 million for the inflow and infiltration correction project. We also literally just hit the submit button yesterday for the three grants that are going to um, hopefully support the Harbor Heights Sports Complex. And then last month we applied for the State Archives grant to support our public records department. We have been awarded another IRTPO grant um, for next year that will help with the Northwest Heller overlay. And we are, um, actually our utilities department right now is working with Commerce. They just put out um, a grant notice um, that they will be refunding cities and towns for some of the um, arrearages due to COVID-19. And then we were not awarded the $3.1 million for Northwest 16th that we applied for, I think it was a couple months ago. 
In terms of ARPA, as you know, we were given $6.58 million. We have that in the bank now. Um, and you all allotted 93% of that so far to date. It equates to about 51 projects or initiatives. We've spent $534,000. And we have a monthly steering committee meeting each month um, where we go over line by line the initiatives and where they're at and making sure that they stay on, on track. And then we spend a little bit of time at the end of each of those meetings to talk about other grant opportunities. So looking ahead at the next three months, we'll be coming back to council with a few, anyway, um, proposals for your approval. The first one is for a broadband study, $50,000 for, uh, excuse me, from the Community Economic Revitalization Board. Uh, Steve Schuler will be presenting two grant opportunities to you uh, very soon. This closes August 19th, but they're from the Transportation Improvement Board. One will be for Northeast 7th Avenue improvements, and the other will be for Whidbey Avenue. There is a grant opening on August 1st called the Defense Community Compatibility Account. It's through Commerce. Um, it is specific to cities that are adjacent to military bases in Washington. So this might be a really great opportunity for us to look at. And then we are also exploring the idea of going to the Economic Development Authority to offset some of the marina dredging. There is a middle mile connectivity grant that is a federal grant. It closes September 30th. We're exploring the idea of a couple of different projects for that. And then another federal project, Safe Streets for All. Um, we are looking to uh, apply for a planning grant. And this would give us a traffic excuse me, a traffic safety action plan, which then we can turn around and we can apply for more federal dollars because you have to have an action plan in order to ask for construction dollars in a lot of the upcoming grant opportunities. So beyond three months, looking out a year and beyond, I'm sure all of you are very well aware that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act or the BIA that the federal government passed is going to be providing billions of dollars to the country um, for infrastructure and that in infrastructure in a lot of different ways. Oh, what did I just do? Oh, thank you. So I'm just going to highlight a couple that we may look to to um, apply to. The first one is the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant. Um, a couple of projects that may apply qualify, include the shoreline mitigation study, or replacing emergency communications. Um, the Reconnecting Communities Planning and Construction Grant, uh, Northeast 7th, maybe the Wetland Trail, or Northwest 16th. Those are all possibilities. And now it's not working. Okay. And then there's also the Rural Surface Transportation Grant. Um, again, more roads. So Northeast 7th or Northwest 16th. Let me see if, I don't know why it's not working, Tim. Oh, there we go, okay. So the Depar Department of Defense also has another special grant for um, communities that are directly located next to military installations. So I know Steve Schuler is also working directly with the Navy right now to determine if there's a project that would both benefit the city and the Navy that we could then apply for these funds. There's going to be multiple digital equity grants coming down the line, which we could apply broadband, IT infrastructure, cybersecurity um, opportunities there. And then the BIA also is giving states what we call block grants. So they're just going to give the Department of Transportation, Washington, WashDOT, you know, big chunks of money. And then they'll turn around and they'll distribute it to cities and towns. So just a few other considerations as we move forward with grants. Um, you know, with the BIA, it's five years of grant funding. So we're going to be looking 
every year to see what would be appropriate for the city to apply for. We obviously can't go for every single grant that's out there. We don't have that capacity, but we'll look at what's appropriate. And then also just looking to um, partnerships with the tribes, other governments, the Navy, even private industry to strengthen any applications that we might have. But I think we have lots of opportunities ahead. I'm excited about this job. And um, I appreciate the time that you've given me today. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Heisen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Horn, on the three months screen, the Defense Community Compatibility Account Grant, what is that for specifically? Well, it doesn't Do actually open. Yet? No, I don't know because it opens, we get the um, notice on August 1st. Yeah. Um, it's a biennial grant. The first one that they um, did, Department of Commerce, was just two years ago. And all of the funding pretty much went to JBLM and the communities surrounding them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like this is a, the second pilot of it. So I'm not quite sure where we'll fit in with it, but there might be opportunities. Yeah, I know sometimes they don't actually release the details until it's right. open. So um, okay, yeah, that'll I'll be interested to hear um, hear more when you know more. Yep. Do, do you do you know uh, approximately the size of those grants for that that went around? They the were BLM? in the millions. Um, nice round figure. Yeah, it was. It, there were a couple that were in the five million, hmm. but. And they were mostly infrastructure grants, if I remember, too, that were awarded the first time round. Okay. Um, yes, Councillor Hoffmeyer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> some real exciting stuff in there. Uh, pretty happy to see seventh pop up on there uh, three different times, I think it was. Oh. <laughs> uh, so anyway. I think uh, there's lots of opportunities for Northeast seventh. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. And I think uh, we decided that you'll come back, like on a quarterly basis. Yes, we will at least try to, to come back every up, up, quarter. Update this. Okay, good, yeah. great. Yeah. Any other questions? Or okay. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Nice job. We'll then move forward um, with our next section, which is, I believe, legal department, starting with uh, ordinance number 1956, amending Oak Harbor Municipal Code Chapter. 1.14 public records. And for both of these, I think we have our city attorney, Hillary Evans. Welcome, Hillary. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, these are two pretty quick and simple things I'm about to present to you. The first one, I hope you can see the PowerPoint. If you cannot, please holler. All I can see is you and your lovely glowing faces on this beautiful day. Um, the first one before you is Ordinance 1956, which would amend Chapter 1.14, um, dealing with public records. And essentially, uh, this ordinance streamlines the process between police and our public records officer, um, clarifies how to get clarification, and makes a couple more routine housekeeping updates. Um, up on the PowerPoint, you'll see the the Public Records Act is essentially supposed to make open government more easy, and this just these changes would just facilitate the spirit of that law. So, because it is quick and dirty housekeeping amendments, I don't anticipate questions, but I am happy to answer any if you have them. Not seeing any. Uh, thank you. Not at all surprised. <laughs> Let's go on to our, uh, item B. I think the second one before you is also pretty simple. I don't have a presentation because it's that simple. Um, your prosecuting attorney um, from Zachar Thomas brought to our attention that Oak Harbor Municipal Code does not have a catch-all criminal provision, which would incorporate all new criminal law adopted by the state by reference, which is a really wonderful thing to do so that you're not constantly amending your own code to keep up with state law, which moves very quickly. So what we have before you in this ordinance would be an amendment to code to simply create a catch-all provision adopting by reference any new or newly amended criminal law adopted by the state. That's it. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions, but I'm happy to answer them if you have them. Well, thanks again, Hillary. That uh, 
pretty okay. I'm not seeing any. I like I like to lob softballs. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to uh, administration. And our first is city council retreat, council staff guidelines, and council goals prioritization. We have our city administrator, Blaine Oborn. Blaine? Yeah, this is kind of the uh, wrap up, uh, some of the things moving forward that we need to kind of tie the loose ends from our uh, successful re uh, retreat in back in March. Uh, two areas to focus on is the uh, council staff guidelines and then the council goals prioritization. So if we can go to the first item, uh, just kind of dealing with that. So um, so what we're looking for here is a, is a guideline uh, for council and staff that will serve as a guide for how council and staff cooperate. And we talked about that in our discussion and, and uh, a lot of topic on that and a lot of good input. And so our facilitator, uh, was able to put it together into a guideline and she has the draft guidelines in your packet today. Uh, so, and then what she also suggested is you can add this to your council rules of procedures if you want to there. So with that, I'll uh, take any questions or comments you have regarding the uh, first part, which is the uh, council staff guidelines. Okay, not seeing any continue okay so if there's some changes before we uh, do this as a council certainly you're welcome to follow up with that in the future and, and provide input and then we'll bring back a final version for council approval on that item so moving on to the next slide here is goals prioritization so we had the nice little exercise and behind you we took down the pictures and you put up a lot of little stickers and there was happened to be 43 of them our facilitator put them together into 12 categories, 11 had specific, and then she kind of did a catch-all. It's all in your packet there. Rather than going over the individual 43 right now, uh, what I'm doing is recommending kind of a method to, to uh, narrow it down to manageable. And then some of the items were, were all put up by individual council members. So one item may be a, a priority of one council member, but not the other ones. And so we should probably focus on ones that are more agreed upon and a, a little bit lower, uh, smaller number would be more manageable. So what I envision here is you have a spreadsheet in your packet there uh, and, and I can give you some homework to do. And your homework would be <laughs> is to uh, complete that form uh, by a specific date that would help me uh, by July 25th and that would help us put all that together and then uh, you score three would be the uh, high priority two would be uh, medium and then one would be low high priority and then we would just score it all and hopefully we'll come up with a ranking system here and somewhere around 10 is what I would recommend the council to cut off and, and accept that and, and make that their strategic plan and, and work on those 10 top categories. And certainly you're welcome to tweak them some too uh, there. So if you can do that, um, we'll go ahead and have a ranking uh, for uh, just kind of an introduction. And then if you can do the scoring in between now and the 25th, we'll get a packet where we have all the ranking and then you can kind of have some in collective input and we can work on finalizing the goals there. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments. So I think we've got a question back on the first uh, page okay. from Mayor Proctor. Um, thank you, Mayor. Mr. Oburn, on the spreadsheet, we're, we're going to rank number four Windjammer. The last one, D. Yes, yeah, install topsoil. I just need clarification. Install topsoil and windjammer through partnership with developments. I wasn't sure what definition we were using for developments in the, with a partnership. I'm going to ask whoever wrote that up to oh, okay. clarify that because I wasn't the one writing them. So, all right, thank you. Wrote okay. it up, so Councilor Evans. Wants to the, the thought process behind that, Mayor Pro Tem, was we have all these housing developments, whether they're a single home or multiple, that come in and they're going to scrape that ground clean, they're going to remove all that topsoil, and then they ship it off to a garden center or they oh. have to dispose of it, and they pay to dispose of it. Um, that's something that we could use as a city uh, to mitigate some of the issues that we have with the lack of topsoil. 
perfect. I would have never come up with that with the word developments in this sentence, but thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Evans. Other questions? Councillor Stuckey. I don't really want to throw a wrench in this, but I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at this list, and I know we're trying to tie the loose ends from the retreat. I guess I have a couple of issues with it. Part of it's my own thing in that when we made this list, some of us were on the newer end or maybe kind of put on the spot to come up with goals right then. Um, there's some things on here that I think we can all agree should be priorities, but they're not, for example, 7th Avenue. We all sat here and said, yep, 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue is not on here. So with that in mind, my first question is, how much weight are being put to these goals? Like when, we, like when we rank these goals, how much weight are we putting onto these goals? You're deciding it. So we did this process four years ago uh, and through the process. And what we did is they did it right in the, in the exercise. And we, we did the button system and we went through and did it. She didn't do the prioritizing as part of the workshop here. But that's really up to the council. I guess what we're envisioning is a document and that's what we have last year. And I think we, you've seen the, the one, the goals that council had in the past uh, that was narrowed down uh, and put forward. But the emphasis is up to the council. So uh, I, I want you to put on that goal. And certainly, if you want to add it, I didn't want to throw it out there. But this is your area. So I, all I am is, is uh, kind of taking over from the facilitator and, and helping you facilitate your goals. Uh, to get there. So certainly when I wrote this, this is one option I had. Uh, certainly if you have other ways you want to deal with it or, or analyze this or, or deal with this in a strategic planning, uh, there's sometimes there's, we did this a little faster way and this is kind of what we did before. I mean, you can even go through a two day strategic planning where you go through a lot more intense uh, Point. We have a lot of other plans, and, and it's part of the process, like 7th Avenue is already on the council, I mean, already on the staff plan, and you made it very clear, and if you notice there, we're looking for funding for it. Uh, so that's already in there. I mean, you certainly you can add it to your own plan if you wanted to, but uh, we certainly have. But some of the other things on there uh, with the uh, downtown and some of the other things are things that haven't been on there. Uh, and certainly you can add it and then just kind of help staff know and helps you know a uh, reminder there of what areas you kind of want to focus on. But sometimes you put areas on there and you chose not to do it. I mean, uh, economic development position was a number one goal. And when we went through the budget process, the council kind of decided that it wasn't, even though it was a goal uh, with measuring it with all the other things that they have, chose not to. Uh, to fund a position, so it just goes. But uh, if you don't have it written down, then it's kind of a wish, and so uh, it's not a bad idea to have kind of prioritizing and, and help staff kind of know where council wants to go, but uh, it's kind of a living document and continues to ebb and flow. So certainly if you want to propose a different way to looking at it, I'm certainly open to that too, or, or collectively uh, council could be open to it, because you guys are really guiding me through this. Because, I mean, I like the concept. I like the idea of having goals, and I like the idea of having a focus so we're not all over the place. I just don't like this particular doc. I don't like us not using something that we paid for. We paid for the facilitator to come here. But they really need to be in smart goal form. I mean, revitalize downtown. What do you do with that? It gives a thought of downtown is important to us, but we need to set goals with some purpose and some thought. We're just taking this list and ranking them. I mean, we have... Snacks for staff. Well, that's just, okay. But I mean, I don't think anyone's going to put that as you know their first priority. So I guess all that to say is I like the idea of goals. If the council as a whole wants to do this and wants to use this list and wants to rank them, I'm happy to do it. I would like the option to add additional goals. I know we need to get this to a manageable form, but I don't think that this, especially not in a smart goal format like livability. What 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 do you? do with that I, I don't I think we do need to have a planning session of some sort to narrow down the goals and I don't think this is the best way to do it happy to do it if that's what the council wants but I don't think this is the most effective way to write goals okay thank you um, Councillor Stuckey Councillor Heisen thank you mayor um, I I'd, I'd ag agree to a point I think that once we prioritize them and then we know um, 
which things the council wants to really emphasize or throw its weight or effort behind, you know, then we can get together and, you know, go to whoever, you know, wrote the, the goal and, and, and get details and try to make, um, make them actionable. So I think, this is a, I think this is a good first step and thank you for reminding them. And I don't know if uh, Mikhail or Sabrina is listening but if you would be kind enough to print this out and put it in my mailbox, uh, my printer at home and I are having creative differences, so I would appreciate the help. <laughs> you too. Yeah, <laughs> and we also can, for council of every month, I would appreciate it very yeah, much. Yeah, we can, we can also email this out to you. That's the way I was thinking in the form, and you can put put it online. Okay, and just fill out in the form. I mean, we can facilitate different ways of doing okay. it. So I had to do it in the printed or in the packet format to begin with, but certainly we can disseminate it to you and in more easily your uh, formats too. Yeah, yeah, just send these yeah. two pages so and So you can go electronically perfect. and just set it, save it and send it back to us and we can certainly do, even possibly get it up to a survey monkey. I mean, there's different ways we could do it. So we, we'll work on that. Yeah, that'd be even easier. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, but back to your question, you're right. A lot of goals need to be refined and I think as part of the process uh, going along, I think we'll, we'll do that. Uh, and talk about it where it is. Um, but uh, it does eliminate some of the areas that might not want to focus on that, that collectively, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly there'll be a lot of discussion on it uh, moving forward. This is just kind of a, a stop on it. But uh, I, I guess what I'm looking for here, uh, you, know, you kind of mentioned some concerns, but I mean, I, I really need an alternative. Otherwise, I'll just continue in this direction. That makes sense, thank you. Other council input or questions? Councilor Hoffmeyer. I have some of the same concerns on, on this here. You know, I, I, I know we need to get to a point to where this is usable. Um, like with the economic development uh, category. I don't know how we have public restrooms on there, but we don't have the economic <laughs> development position, for instance. Uh, especially since some of us are and we're so passionate about that. Um, you know, you come down a little further where it says utility infrastructure. I mean, I, I think maybe, maybe if that was, would have just been more infrastructure more broadly. I mean, obviously every one of us up here is pretty passionate about the roads as well. Um, so I just, I wonder, I, I wonder if there is not some more stuff that we should attach to this before it's sent out for a survey. Yeah, one of the things you could do is rather than go right to the survey is, is submit suggestions for changing the form or add additional things. I mean, we can work this through in multiple uh, meetings. So certainly rather than doing the survey, uh, you could comment on the thing by the 25th and then I can come back on the 3rd or we can do this on a monthly, however you want to do it. Uh, we, we don't have to get this done tomorrow. So certainly have time to, to plenty of time to to uh, kind of tweak it and so it looks to me like some council members want to provide additional input or changes to the item so I, I would suggest then then provide uh, you know sit down and provide additional information and I'll keep on tweaking this form uh, until we get to one we feel like council feels like comfortable to bring forward and rank I, I think that's a real real good idea. I think you might find that four or five, maybe even seven of us uh, would like to see some certain things on here that aren't on here right now. Um, so I, I think that would be a really good step. Okay, so then I would ask that, it sounds like the consensus here is that provide further input. So I would ask that you rather than do, it, do the form, but I mean, just go ahead and, and uh, submit uh, possible recommendations for additions or changes to the existing form and I'll bring it on the, the third and kind of tweak it from there and we'll just go through multiple council meetings uh, working through this process. When do you need those recommendations submitted? So we have to do the packets by ordinance the Thursday before, so the 25th is that Monday, so that gives me about three days to tweak it into a document. So the 25th is the due date in there Assuming we were going to just do the ranking, but if you can do the changes by the 25th, that'll allow me to, to develop a new form. We can talk about it and, and see whether council wants to do per, uh, further uh, tweaking or, or is ready to start the ranking process. Other um, 
Back to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Blaine, when we do, I believe it's the Capital Improvement Plan, the CIP, it's a list, even though it has one through 10 or one through 20, but as the staff sees that there's a grant or an opportunity, they can take number 10 and make it number one and things like that. If council gets this to, it, it is our list, but I would really like to have staff go over it with us because some of these things concern their department and I think they could help us narrow it how to write it up more finely to have it accomplished. In other words, not just revitalize downtown. Um, well, you know, part of that is if you have economic development, we'll help with that and, and part of that's, the ch you know what I mean? It's, but if we have a staff kind of in it say, hey, this is where we're headed, it is supposed, we're supposed to be a team. And, and I appreciate when a staff member can say, you're getting there, but I can't help unless it's kind of defined to make it possible to reach some of those goals. So I'm just wondering if there's a point if council would like, or as an opportunity comes up, maybe even though we have it one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, that if there's a chance for number five to move to number one because our grant writer sees a grant, I mean, I'm trying to make it workable but not so rigid that there's some flexibility in it like we do with our CIP plan. Yeah, it's our list, I know, but sometimes having, we're depending on staff to help us with this list, but if we don't have a little bit of feedback from them, then we may be going down this road and they're over here. So I would like, we're supposed to be a team to work this out. Yes, it is our list, but there's a big part of the team the staff that makes everything happen. Yeah, oh no, and I just meant it's our list. We can do yep. anything we, we can do. Okay, so I'm just, are. that's just my question. <clears throat> I'm looking for other comments from the council on that, but they may not be seeing it the way I am. Thank you, sir. Okay, back to Councillor Stuckey, I think. I suppose it's a proposal because, I mean, you're obviously looking for direction. I don't want to be, I don't want us to be vague here, not give clear direction. I personally would like the idea of each one of how many goals would in a perfect world how many goals would you like? I was I would like ten probably is what okay. I was suggesting. Okay. I don't know if we we'll get to ten. So my proposal is we all write ten goals. I mean today I'm, I'm suggesting we scrap this. Okay. We all write ten goals. Smart goal format. It's got to be specific, measurable, actionable, reasonable. Leave the time part off because the time's up to staff. We can't tell staff we need this. Ten goals. We either submit them to the city administrator and kind of see which ones cross over, or we can do a special meeting where we kind of make our pitch and talk about them. But I think having it specific like that and doing a special meeting, if we're going to say that this is important, we should have no problem doing a special meeting and spending an hour or two to hash it out correctly. I just think this was done kind of in haste. We're like struggling. Oh, I got to think of something. I got to put something up there. And again, a lot of these like the livability, we're all for livability. But like, that's not a tangible goal that we can work on. You can massage it, but let's do a special meeting and let's each come up with 10 thoughts, ideas, and, and move from there as opposed to taking this. We don't have to use this because we paid for it. It'd be nice to, but we don't have to use this, so. Uh, thank you, Councilor Stuckey. Councilor Heisen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think that that's a really good suggestion. I, my suggestion was gonna be for uh, you know, since we're the ones that contributed this list that, you know, we could go in and, you know, like whoever wrote stabilized utility rates, you know, maybe expand on that. What do they mean by that? What, how do they think we can do that? But I think that I'm um, using this list as a reminder and as a jumping off point, if we were to narrow it down to our 10, our top 10 and include details and an and a explanation, um, I think that that I think that that's a really great idea. And I'd absolutely, I, we'd be all for um, getting together, you know, in person to, um, to go over our, you know, each of our list of 10 and, you know, make our case for them. So um, if we want to have a meeting about it, that's great. But um, if, if um, everybody's in agreement, and instead of ranking this list, I would be happy to take my contributions or um, submit my top 10 uh, to Blaine instead of 
of ranking the list if everybody else wants to do the same thing. Does that work for everybody in the top 10? Ish, yeah. I see a couple of head nods. Anybody? Yeah, Councilor Evans. Well, I think the, the goal that Mr. Administrator is trying to accomplish is just to get some direction from us. And this is a great starting point to, I mean, it's our words. We put them up on the wall. So I don't know what else he could have brought to us. Um, I, I agree that, yes, we have some changes that we'd like to make in here. Um, and these were our words. So, yeah, if we want, I'll agree with the comments that have been made. If we want to take pieces out of this and make it part of our top ten, great. And uh, I'm definitely up for a meeting to set our priorities and, and give administration some direction. I think we got a general head nod. Looks like good. Okay. Thank you, Council. Appreciate that. Council yeah. Over. I want to make sure. <laughs> Council <laughs> Over. City it is. Uh, is July 25th enough time for you to do the top 10 or do you want more time? And then I may or may not have it ready for since it's a little tweaked differently uh, for the August meeting, but certainly I'll, I'll uh, keep it timely moving along. And if we uh, kind of feel like we need to do a special meeting, then we have that option too. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Good, we'll move on then to item B at this time, right? Under administration, that's a preview of the city website redesign. And I, we have our communications and IT manager, Sabrina Combs. Sabrina. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I just wanted to give you a preview of our new website. I'm being mean and showing the current website um, <laughs> before I show you the new one. Uh, bottom line, what I first wanted to say was thank you to Council Members Marshall and Heisen for assisting us on our project team and also to Julie Lindsay, Mikhail Finkel, and Sandra Place because they were part of the team as well so that we could set up this new website design. And um, staff, we had our administrative support team members, those folks who support in different departments, they attended training on July 12th and 13th and did a great job of sitting with our trainer to learn how the new website works. And our current plan is to have a go live date of August 24th. And as part of that, we will also be moving from an oakharbor.org to oakharbor.gov. So we are stepping it up a notch. So with no further ado, here is your new site. So as you can see, and no, I did not plan that for prior to be first. That's just what happened. Um, <laughs> You can see the new site has this great new layout. It's um, visually appealing to the audience of people we want to show this to. We also have our social media tool buttons here. And thanks to a staff member's idea, we also added the text for those so that people connect. We changed the search option to how can we help. We have these mega menus, is how we refer to them, that help people get around the site to see information. And as you can see, we created some titles that should be easier for our community to connect with. Then as they scroll down, we have these easy connection buttons that also have an image or an icon to assist them in finding those items. And then we can go into news and events and a calendar where it highlights when there's an event that's going on so they know to click on that date. And then we come further down and we can do additional spotlights for the community. So I'm just going to show you some of our pages that we have so that you can see what it looks like. Of course, I'm going to show you the city council page. So here is a city council page. It highlights the information, gives some great info here to assist people in connecting with the meeting details. And then as we roll down, we get into your contact information, which is easier for them to find. It connects with your photos really easily. And then just for fun, I'll show you one of the departments we've been working on. So here's our marina page. One of the features we like is we can do some information here to make it easier for departments to share specific information to connect. Uh, we have the quick buttons to go back at the bottom. And then we also have information that we can put here, their social media feeds, and of course, links to other areas on the department. One of the other features that's very helpful is you can click right here and go back to the home page. So that's just a quick preview. Staff is currently working on revising and editing pages. Um, they have the next couple of weeks that we'll be working on that and we'll be doing some cleanup. So that is the site. And then I'll open it up for any questions or comments you might have. 
Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, we'll turn first to Councillor Evans. Just curious on the mobile side, uh, if we'll get to see a preview of that as well at some point. It looks great, by the way. Thank you. Yes, we will. And the mobile side is also much better. I will say that off the, off the bat. Um, it lines it up a little bit differently, but I can send you a link so that you can all see it on your mobile phones. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Saki? Uh, Councillor Evans asked my question, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question was. Councillor Hoffmeyer. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's what I was going to ask as well, Sabrina. You know, uh, seeing all the, uh, the the tabs in the upper left-hand corner, uh, it looked like all those pages were a pretty short scroll. So, uh, I'm assuming it will do uh, pretty good in the mobile. Um, as the uh, the picture of City Hall just popped up there, I, I can't help but to notice the uh, the staff member that was behind me with a yellow bucket of paint. So. The yellow stripe that's going around the building, amazing touch. Uh, hopefully we can get that picture on the, the website as well. Yes, um, so one of the great things about this new site is, is that it's much easier for us as staff to change out the photos that are on here. We can work with the departments and have a couple of feature photos. We can change them out on a regular basis, say seasonally to start with, so that we can highlight the city in different looks and feels as the seasons change around our community. So we really like that. So it'll be easy for us to go out front, take a photo, and put it on the site as soon as projects like that are completed. So we're very excited about that. We can also do text items for things like, I don't know, a fire levy. Um, so we can share that information in a quick and easy way. These are also linkable, so we can make them so that you could click on it and link right to the page where the information is. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Any other questions or input? OK. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, excellent job, done quickly and very professionally. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go. You to are our, welcome. Looks like our last item uh, of the day for this meeting is under administration is the city administrator's report. Yeah. Good evening. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. So, Oak Harbor City Administrator Blaine Oborn. Uh, my monthly report here certainly appreciate all the teamwork here and, and going together and putting this together and and uh just going to go over a few uh items here and and add a few things because everything uh kind of changes here uh after printing of this a week ago so one of the areas in development services just want to highlight that we're uh in negotiations or discussions with uh, Winby Camino Land Trust regarding the conservation easement acquisition and regarding the letter we sent out that we provided a copy to you on that and hopefully we'll come to some agreement on that. We did have some follow up with them and they were still uh, uh, not ready to comment yet, but hopefully we'll have some communication there. So uh, and then certainly the finance department, uh, it's our biannual year 23-2024. We had our kickoff meeting here um, so had a great uh, jeopardy uh, game here and learned some trivia on uh, on budgets and so uh, appreciate the effort there and then certainly the uh, utility rate study is ongoing a little update there um, fire department and also police department uh, the national night out uh, justice our uh, council meeting every year so uh, don't come here on Tuesday the uh, second uh, go to uh, where is it at now? Windjammer. Windjammer Park, fresh my memory here. So uh, Windjammer Park and, and go there and then come here on Wednesday night for our council meeting, on regular council meeting on Wednesday night. Just recapping that one. Uh, human resources, uh, we started the uh, recruitment for the Parks and Recreation Director position. Appreciate the support there. Uh, great effort there. And certainly I've, I've had a few council members that reached out so far and volunteered for being on the panel there. Uh, so, and then also uh, the boat launch is open, but w without a float. So uh, we'll work on that. And then Flintstone Park, uh, I believe they've got the installation and the uh, dock working there uh, for the float in Flintstone Park. And I mentioned that last report that it was delayed. Uh, police department, uh, 
a little discussion on the county side regarding RV living, and it kind of relates to our discussion on, on, on safety problems with uh, RV parking and, and dilapidated RT, uh, RVs and requiring, requiring to do uh, input. And then we received a number of complaints from the park and ride that's outside of city limits, but yet in our zip code. And uh, so we passed that on to multiple uh, people at the county level, and I did have communication with two of the three commissioners regarding their discussion about a moratorium in the county, and I was concerned with the effect and the current uh, complaints we're getting in the county and the effect uh, that it may have on the city. So, and then on that, uh, the uh, I know my window looks a lot better looking out with the demolition of some old buildings there on city property, and it's just uh, really great to see uh, staff in action there. and. I think demo is a fun thing to do. Probably, I wish I could have been doing the controls. So, certainly appreciate the efforts there uh, on that. And that concludes the areas I wanted to focus on. Now, I'll take any questions or comments. Any questions, um, Councilor Hoffmeyer? You mentioned the demolition of the little shed out here behind us. Um, what what time frame do you think the house may be moved on? So we did have some interest to uh, somebody to, to uh, buy the house and move it. So we have the process of doing an RFP right now and Sand Replace is working on that. And it will come out shortly on that. So it's an option if somebody can buy it and, and assemble it themselves or they can just move it. And so now they have a kind of a path to go out rather than going the other way with the uh, removal of that. So if there's no interest, uh, we'll go ahead and do the burn like we, we did before. We took it off the schedule there, and we thought if, if there was, because we got some inquiries through the uh, notice of that, that, that people were interested in it. So if certainly if we can help the uh, affordability of housing and somebody can move that to a more suitable location and, and save some money on construction, we wanted to offer that, or, or somebody can cannibalize that and, and, and utilize it and save some money. So we rather than... <laughs> Continuing with the previous plan burn, then uh, we're, we're holding up and doing that process, and we'll see where it goes. Um, so hopefully we'll get some bidders and, and some people. But we had enough inquiries that we decided to kind of redirect, and rather than just burning it down to, to give the opportunity to somebody to buy it for next to nothing. Uh, and we have to do everything on a competitive basis, so uh, it's a competitive basis uh, in, in the... Uh, applying there and I know I was successful in other communities where we had that similar kind of thing where we had some buildings were interested and people moved them rather than us having to, to demo it or, or burn it down. So that's what we're doing now is kind of see where that goes and then we'd come back to the council for final approval of any agreement. So what do you think, Blaine? Three months? Probably, yes. I hate to put you on the spot like that. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I asked, uh, I think she's ready within a few weeks uh, to get the application out there and probably would run a month. So within three months, yes. Great. That's a good Great. estimate. Any other input? Questions? Well, seeing no other, we are to the point of adjourning the meeting. I think a little bit earlier than the bet at City Council, as a matter of fact. Not bad. Uh, not, not bad to yeah. <laughs> So seeing no other business, I will uh, call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, Council and staff especially and, and uh, for all the work.